This is only uh, Carlson with his new discoveries on the canon and the temple scroll. I only missed the first few seconds, so you know he's talking about the temple scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The temple scroll is, in fact, the original version of the book of Deuteronomy, the original book of the law, and that the current version of the book of Deuteronomy in everyone's Bibles is a fabricated version of the book of the law made by scribes who wanted to have a version of the book of the law which was compatible with their man-made traditions. The Temple Scroll was found in the 11th cave of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1956, and it was the longest intact scroll that was found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, nearly 30 feet long. Unfortunately, the scroll is not fully preserved. The beginning and ending of the scroll was cut off. Furthermore, a lot of the upper half of the scroll is usually missing due to decay and deterioration of the scroll over time. The Temple Scroll, although it was found in 1956, it wouldn't be until 1967 that it would be secured by the scholars from the hands of the Arabs. In 1967, during the Six-Day War, Yigiel Yadin, while serving Israel as a military advisor, was commissioned by Israel after Jerusalem had been finally recaptured by Israel to secretly purchase the Temple Scroll from an Arab antiquities dealer in Bethlehem for about $100,000. This Arab, a man named Kando, illegally had possession of the Temple Scroll. Yigiel Yadin, using his military authority and power, forcibly made Kando sell the Temple Scroll to him. Unfortunately, Kando's possession of the Temple Scroll did considerable damage to the scroll. Now, the significance of these events couldn't be more mind-blowing. For what are the odds that the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1948, in the very year that Israel was once again, that Israel once again became a nation after 2,000 years? And what are the odds that the Temple Scroll was recovered at the same time that Jerusalem was once again restored to Israel during the Six-Day War after 2,000 years? What is also very impressive is that the Israeli military was so convinced of the extremely high value and importance of the Temple Scroll for the state of Israel that they went during a major war in Israel to purchase it. It wouldn't be for another 11 years until the Temple Scroll was released to the public in 1978, and it wouldn't be until six years after that, in 1984, that the Temple Scroll was translated into English for the first time. The Temple Scroll presents itself as Yahuwah speaking to Moses and teaching him the entire Law of Moses, speaking to him all the laws contained in the first four books of the Law of Moses, as well as teaching him many new laws not found elsewhere in the Law of Moses. Modern scholars believe that the Temple Scroll is not a version of the Book of Deuteronomy, but is rather an apocryphal writing which used the Book of Deuteronomy as one of its sources. However, I believe it can be shown that the ancient Essenes who collected the, collected the Dead Sea Scrolls 2,000 years ago and treasured these Dead Sea Scrolls as scripture believed that the Temple Scroll was not a book based on the Book of Deuteronomy, but rather that the Temple Scroll was the original Book of Deuteronomy and that the Book of Deuteronomy that we currently have in all copies outside of the Dead Sea Scrolls was based on the Temple Scroll, the Temple Scroll being the original fifth book of the Law of Moses. Furthermore, I believe it can be shown conclusively with compelling evidence that they were right, and that the Temple Scroll is, in fact, the original version of the Book of Deuteronomy. It is my contention that the Samaritans are responsible for corrupting the original Book of Deuteronomy by place, replacing it with their own special version, the very version that all Jews and Christians are familiar with today, the version of Deuteronomy that is in all Bibles. In the Temple Scroll, it gives a list of laws for the Temple and the city of Jerusalem, and these laws are completely irreconcilable with the Samaritan Temple that the Samaritans had built on Mount Gerizim. We see in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah that the Samaritans wanted to help the Jews build their own temple, but that the Jews turned them away and prohibited them from assisting them in the construction of their temple. Because of this, the Samaritans decided to build their own temple on Mount Gerizim, 
Now, because they wanted to justify their belief that their temple on Mount Gerizim was the true temple endorsed by Yahuwah, they had to remove all portions of the law of Moses which did not agree with their temple. When you compare the contents of the temple scroll with the contents of the book of Deuteronomy, the vast majority of the extra portions of the temple scroll which are not in any other copies of the book of Deuteronomy are commandments which explicitly contradicted the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim. Now, when the second temple was finished, according to the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, the second temple was not built according to the measurements that the Torah commands. Those measurements the Torah commands being the same measurements that King Solomon used for the first temple. In fact, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah and the book of the prophet, the prophet Haggai both tell us that the measurements of the second temple were much smaller than the first temple's measurements. According to the Testament of Levi, the son of Jacob, a book which was considered scripture in the Dead Sea Scrolls, immediately after the second temple had been built, the high priesthood overseeing the temple sacrificial system in Jerusalem became corrupt and was contrary to the law of Moses' requirements for the temple and its sacrifices. This being the case, it makes perfect sense why a majority of the Jews, in joint conspiracy with the Samaritans, decided to reject the original book of Deuteronomy in favor of the Samaritan book of Deuteronomy, book of Deuteronomy because like the Samaritans, the temple scroll opposed the Jewish, uh, the Jewish temple and their high priesthood system. For both the Samaritan temple and its high priesthood system on Mount Gerizim and the Jewish temple and its high priesthood system in Jerusalem contradicted a large amount of the temple scroll's requirements for the temple and the holy city that was to surround the temple. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the scroll known as 4Q177, we read the following. Sound the horn in Gibeah. The horn is the book of the law, which is the book of Deuteronomy, which all the men of his council have spurned, and they have spoken revolt against it. This scroll, 4Q177, supports the idea that the keepers of the Dead Sea Scrolls believed that there was a conspiracy by the Pharisees and Samaritans in corrupting and speaking against the book of Deuteronomy. Now, the Temple Scroll is a very beautiful scroll and preserves a whopping 66 columns of text. Mm -hmm. The first 47 columns have virtually no parallel whatsoever in our copies of Deuteronomy and preserve commands about the temple and the courtyards. Then, after column 48, the Temple Scroll preserves the following passages in the following order. A very enlarged version of Deuteronomy chapter 14 in columns 48 to 51. A very enlarged version of Deuteronomy chapter 12 in columns 51 to 54. Then Deuteronomy chapter 13 in columns 54 to 55. Deuteronomy chapter 17 with a few minor additions in columns 55 to 57. Then came the Law of the Kings in columns 57 to 59. And then Deuteronomy chapter 18 with a few minor additions and Deuteronomy chapter 19 verses 15 to 21 came in columns 60 to 61. Following this was Deuteronomy chapter 20 with a few minor additions in columns 61 to 63. And then Deuteronomy chapter 21 with a few minor additions in columns 63 to 64. And finally Deuteronomy chapter 22 with a few minor additions in columns 64 to 66. That is what we have in the Temple Scroll. So it is clear from the fact that Deuteronomy chapters 14, 12, 13, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22 immediately follow one another in columns 48 to 66 of the Temple Scroll, that the Temple Scroll is claiming to be a version of Deuteronomy. Unfortunately, the copy of the Temple Scroll that was found ends with Deuteronomy chapter 22, the rest of the scroll's ending being lost. But other fragments of the original Deuteronomy survive elsewhere in the Dead Sea Scrolls. For example, 1Q22 is what scholars call the words of Moses and came from the beginning section of the Temple Scroll. Also, a fragment from 4Q365a preserves text just before the Temple portion of the Temple Scroll begins. The book of Deuteronomy used to be one of my least favorite books of the Bible. Whenever I read it, Something seemed off. It seemed like it was a mostly redundant and useless book, not being very original at all. 
If you took the book of Deuteronomy out of your Bibles, you'd essentially have the contents of the entire book of Deuteronomy in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Thus, for all practical purposes, the book of Deuteronomy had very little value in my eyes. The whole spirit of the book did not seem to resonate with Scripture. Yet I ignored these feelings, thinking it unwise to be so bold as to throw out Deuteronomy, especially since Deuteronomy was quoted as Scripture by the Messiah and Apostles. In 2012, however, after much study, I received a revelation that the Temple Scroll is in fact the original Deuteronomy. The Temple Scroll, being very different from our copies of Deuteronomy, is now my favorite book of the Old Testament. Based on the Temple Scroll and the Dead Sea Scrolls fragments of Deuteronomy, it can be determined that the size of the original Deuteronomy was approximately 68 chapters. Thus, it was about double the size of our copies of Deuteronomy. We can also determine, using the Temple Scroll and the Dead Sea Scroll fragments of Deuteronomy, what most of the content of the original Deuteronomy was. And so the following is what the Dead Sea Scrolls revealed to be the original version of the book of Deuteronomy. First came Deuteronomy chapters 1 to 11. Then came an expanded version of Deuteronomy chapters 15 to 16. After this came the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 12. Following came about 16 additional chapters about how to build the temple, how to sacrifice properly during the holy days, and how to keep the holy days properly, and how to build the temple courtyards, and the laws relating to the services of the temple courtyards. All this section, the entirety of it, was removed from our copies. Afterwards came a highly expanded version of Deuteronomy chapter 14. Then came an expanded version of Deuteronomy chapter 12, mishmashed with verses from all over our copies of the book of Deuteronomy. Next came Deuteronomy chapter 13, followed by Deuteronomy chapter 17. Then came an additional chapter on the law of the kings. All this section, the entirety of it, was removed from our copies. Then came Deuteronomy chapter 18 and the second half of chapter 19. The first half of chapter 19 occurred somewhere else in the book, and not here, as in our copies. Subsequent to this came Deuteronomy chapters 20 to 22, followed by a rearranged version of Deuteronomy chapters 23 to 25. Then there was an additional concluding section of exhortation on the law and summary of all the commandments. And finally came the last section, Deuteronomy chapters 26 to 34. What I have just presented is a very close representation of the contents of original Deuteronomy. Now, one question you may be all wondering, how could something like this be possible? How could a scribe do such a thing? It seems unbelievable, you might think, that books of scripture could be so altered and corrupted. One would be naturally inclined to think that, except for the fact we have many examples of this very thing happening with other books of scripture. The following is an overview of this very thing happening. Genesis, Exodus, and Numbers in the Samaritan version of the Torah, in the Septuagint, and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, are much fuller than the version of those three books of Torah in most Bibles, often containing repetitious material. It is evident that the scribes removed the repetitions because they felt the material was excessively redundant. The Septuagint version of 1st and 2nd Samuel, as well as the Dead Sea Scrolls version, is much longer than the version of 1st and 2nd Samuel, which is in most Bibles. The fuller details were deemed unnecessary by the scribes to convey the main important parts of the book, and that is why most Bible versions of 1st and 2nd Samuel have much fewer details. The Septuagint version of 1st Kings is very different, full of rearrangements and repetitious treatment of the same accounts multiple times. The standard version of 1 Kings in most people's Bibles thus seems to represent a secondary version intended to smooth over the book and make it easier for readers to follow along. The Septuagint version of the book of Proverbs has many additional Proverbs not in most people's Bibles, and also some of the chapters of the book of Proverbs are in a completely different order. The Dead Sea Scrolls version of the book of Psalms presents a version of the book of Psalms which is approximately the same order for Psalms 1 to 102, but for the remaining Psalms, it puts Psalms 103 to 150 in a very different order, and also included 14 additional Psalms, not in most people's Bibles. The Septuagint version of the book of Job was made by a translator who felt the book of Job was highly questionable morally to an untrained audience. 
and thus the group he translated it for, the Greeks, received the copy that was very mutilated. Huge portion, portions of the book of Job were removed. Often the portions that were removed were just repetitions via parallelism and similar phrases which said the same thing just said by the speaker, but in a slightly different way. But other times, the portions that were removed were extremely extensive. Analysis of the removed portions indicates that those portions were removed because they contained teachings which were, or at least sounded, very close to blasphemy and were full of false teaching. The false teaching coming from Job's friends falsely accusing him, that is. The scribe did not want the readers to draw from Job or Job's friends out of context support for sinful doctrines, like is sometimes done by people today who quote the book of Job out of context to support certain doctrines. So much was the tendency of the Septuagint translator to remove material dangerous for ignorant readers, he removed approximately half of the entire speech of Elihu, the last man who argued against Job, and arguably the man who was most evil and wicked of them all, seeing as how Elihu, alone of the companions of Job, was not forgiven by God. The book of Jeremiah suffered a similar fate in the Septuagint version. The Septuagint version removes many passages of the original book of Jeremiah which are in our copies. The Septuagint also has the chapters of the oracles against the nations in a completely different order and place in the book than in our copies. I believe our copies of Jeremiah represent the full scope of the original text, but that the Septuagint order is more authentic. But whether or not the Septuagint version of Jeremiah is more authentic or not, in either case, the Septuagint version of the book of Jeremiah proves that scribes were very bold to rearrange and censor portions of the scripture for editorial or theological reasons, motivations, and intention. The book of First Ezra is an ancient version of the book of Ezra. The first few chapters of the book of Ezra and the book of First Ezra are in a different order, and a story about the contest about what was the strongest thing to justify building the second temple was completely removed from our copies of the book of Ezra. The book of Esther was completely mutilated in most people's Bibles. The original version, preserved in the Septuagint, has much additional material not in most people's Bibles. Scholars claim that these are additions to Esther and class them as apocryphal in nature. But for us who believe in the divine inspiration of the scriptures, it makes much more sense the Septuagint version of Esther is the original version. The godless version of Esther was not the original version, it being godless because it makes no mention of Yahuwah, God, or anything about the law or the religion of Yahuwah. But in the Septuagint version of Esther, it mentions the name of Yahuwah more than 50 times, and it is a very religious book and explicitly endorses the law of Moses throughout it, and contains prayers by Esther and Mordecai, and even has a dream and its interpretation by Mordecai. The Dead Sea Scroll version of Song of Solomon preserves the Song of Solomon in an order that is very different for the second half of the book as well. And the Book of the Twelve Prophets had their order arranged very differently in the Dead Sea Scrolls version and the Septuagint version compared to the order in most people's Bibles. Thus, for the Book of the Twelve Prophets, the tendency of scribes towards rearrangement was done once again, rearranging material to fit their beliefs about the historical succession of the Twelve Prophets. In the Septuagint and Dead Sea Scrolls versions of the Twelve Prophets, also many details were preserved which are not in most people's Bibles. The Book of Daniel in the Septuagint version has two additions added to it from an apocryphal book of Habakkuk. Since these two additions came from an apocryphal book of Habakkuk, our Daniel in the Septuagint version testifies to the boldness of the scribes to alter the text of the Bible by adding and removing portions. The Song of the Three Holy Children in the Furnace in the Septuagint version seems very authentic and likely to be part of the original book of Daniel. The song was probably removed from the Hebrew manuscripts of Daniel because it was extremely repetitive and redundant in nature, constantly repeating the same refrain over and over again, only changing the subject each time. In addition, the book of Daniel in the Septuagint version, compared to our copies of Daniel in most people's Bibles, is also heavily rearranged in Daniel chapters 4 to 6. In a few copies of the Septuagint, the Book of Tobit is much longer than all other Septuagint copies of the Book of Tobit. When the longer version of the Book of Tobit was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was proven that the original is in fact the longer version. 
This, however, suggests that the version of the book of Tobit that was in virtually all Bibles for over 1,000 years was missing major portions of the original book of Tobit. The shorter version, as can now be demonstrated in our times, is clearly a condensation and summary of the lengthy and drawn-out account of Tobit's story. The translator, knowing his audience lacked a strong attention span, removed the lengthy nature of the discourses and storytelling by clipping the original significantly. The book of Ahakar also bears evidence of much revision. Like the book of Proverbs, the Proverbs of Ahakar were completely rearranged. And one final example is the Testament of Levi. The Testament of Levi in the original version had an extremely lengthy discourse about the laws of the priesthood and other prophecies given to Levi. These laws and prophecy were significantly shortened and, content, and condensed in the Greek translation of the original version. Thus, the tendency to abbreviate and remove passages of laws has here a parallel. The Christians who were translating the Testament of Levi did not have any use for the sacrifice laws in the Testament of Levi. So they simply removed most of the laws and summarized it by saying that Levi was taught the laws of the priesthood and left it at that. Though the Greek version does hint at the nature of a few of the laws, but nevertheless, the Greek version prevents all Christians who read the Testament of Levi in the Middle Ages to accurately understand the full laws for the sacrificial ordinances of the Levitical priesthood. There are also many other examples of other books of the Apocrypha where scribes have rearranged, omitted large amount of content, and added content. Since then, this phenomenon of rearrangement, omission of large amount of content and addition of content occurred so many times in books of the scripture as well as in the apocrypha this provides a strong parallel and plausible believability that the original version of deuteronomy could have been completely shortened and rearranged by a scribal community who thought that those per portions were no longer applicable or relevant for today especially not relevant for gentile readership indeed the sacrifices have not been done in the temple since the first century, and the second temple and its priesthood did not meet the specifications commanded and required in the temple school. Thus, for essentially the entirety of the second temple period, as well as the last 2,000 years, most of the portions in the temple school about the temple and the priesthood were completely unable to be kept and applied and impossible to implement. Thus, the very long and tiresome material, which was extremely hard for scribes to understand due to how technical the language being used was, had sufficient justification in the minds of the scribes to be completely chopped out, all portions about the temple and priesthood being removed as irrelevant and unnecessary to reproduce and copy out in their version of Deuteronomy. This was a huge mistake, I believe, and now Yahuwah has given us the Dead Sea Scrolls in the very last days so that we can have the resources and materials necessary to return to entirely and restore the full law of Moses amongst his people and that we can build the temple as it's supposed to be in the land of Israel and Jerusalem. If Yahuwah wanted us to have the temple scroll so we can finally build the temple correctly, and the priesthood can finally be fully obedient to the law of Moses, it makes sense why the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the same exact year that the land of Israel was restored, and why the temple scroll was recovered in the same exact week that the city of Jerusalem was restored to the nation of Israel. A cursory examination of the events surrounding the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls gives sufficient justification to believe that the discovery and recovery of these documents was divinely orchestrated and planned by Yahuwah so that we could restore the original faith of the scriptures and that we can make a full return in repentance to the law of Moses. There are passages in the scripture which support the idea that the law can be corrupted and lost over time and that it was in fact corrupted and lost several times. Jeremiah 8 says, I listened and heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course, as the horse rushes into the battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times, and the turtle dove, the swift, and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Look, the false pen of the scribe certainly works falsehood. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? So we see that according to Jeremiah chapter 8, the people who claim that they are wise and say that the law of Yahuwah is with them are wrong. 
because the scribes of the law worked falsehood, using a false pen, as Jeremiah puts it. It goes on to say those men who consider themselves wise have rejected the word of Yahuwah, or in other words, rejected the law of Yahuwah, since the law of Yahuwah is the word of Yahuwah, and they think they have it, but Jeremiah says they don't. And so he says those who have the corrupted law written by the false pen of scribes who work falsehood into their scribal work, these have no wisdom. He says in verse 6 that the people of Israel, everyone turns to his own course rather than following the course the law of Yahuwah commands. This is a perfect description of how people today try to follow the law. There are so many divided beliefs and opinions and understandings amongst people about how to keep properly the law and which parts have to be kept and to what extent they have to be kept. If we had the original law, then people wouldn't go after their own course, but the path of the law would be very clear for everyone. We are told in verse 7 that the animals know their appointed times, but Israel does not, because they do not know the law of Yahuwah due to their false scribal work hiding the requirements of the law from the people. This is why we constantly see Yeshua the Messiah rebuking the Pharisees and the scribes for having the keys to the kingdom, but hiding them from the people so that they could not enter themselves, for the scribes had access to the fuller copies, but hid the fuller copies from the people so that they could not follow the law entirely, but would have to be dependent upon the Pharisees for knowing how to keep the parts of the law which the law of Moses alluded to, but which were not in the public copies that most people had access to. Now Deuteronomy 4, chapter 4 reads, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. This passage is a warning that we are not to add or take away from the word of the law of Moses. But this warning only makes sense if it's possible to add or take away from the word of the law of Moses. If it was impossible to happen, there would be no sense in warning about it. So then when it warns us, it teaches us that it is possible that many commandments of the law could be taken away from the law of Moses due to scribes taking them away. And if the Temple Scroll is the original book of the law, then that is indeed what happened. Hosea 8 verse 12 reads, I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. This passage says that many Jews considered things in the law of Moses as foreign and not part of what is truly inspired by Yahuwah. This suggests that the great things written in the temple scroll which Yahuwah wrote were considered as foreign to the law. And we see that is still the case today. So how could something so horrible as the original law of Moses being lost happen? How could I have the audacity to claim that part of the law of Moses has been lost? I am not being any more bold in claiming that the book of Deuteronomy was lost than the Old Testament is, for the Old Testament records in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles an account of the book of the law of Moses being lost and then found by King Josiah. And a great reform was made in Israel to return to the Torah. Here is what we are told in Second Chronicles chapter 34. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, all that was committed to thy servants, they do it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and to the hand of the workmen. And then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the law, that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah and Ahakim the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, the son of Micah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. And then in verse 29, Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and the king went up into the house of the Lord, 
and all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. Now, what is really impressive with the entire passage I just quoted from Second Chronicles is that virtually all scholars are in unanimous agreement that this lost and missing book of the law, which was found by Josiah, was either the book of Deuteronomy or a proto-version of the book of Deuteronomy. Can this be a coincidence? I think not. So then we see that the book of Deuteronomy had a tendency of getting lost, corrupted, and abused, as the passage from Second Chronicles here proves. Thus, some things in the original Deuteronomy the Jews did not like, for they kept hiding it and concealing it from the people. Josiah, upon hearing the extra things in the original book of Deuteronomy, which were not mentioned in the first four books of the law, and seeing how lawless they had been due to not having access to the full law of Moses, repented with a great repentance and made a revival and restored the book of the law for all the people and releasing it publicly to them. Also, seeing how almost nothing in the book of Deuteronomy, in our, in our book of Deuteronomy, is not found in the first four books of the law of Moses, the fact that Josiah was weeping when he heard the lost book of the law being read for the first time since it had been lost, suggests that this book of the law that was found in the time of Josiah had many more commandments than in the first four books of the law. Otherwise, he would not have wept, seeing as how our copies of Deuteronomy have nothing in them that would drive someone to weep, which he did not already have, which he did not already read in the first four books of the law of Moses. If it was our version of the book of Deuteronomy that was the lost book of the law that was found in the time of Josiah, there would not have been a major revival of Israel, consisting in returning to the law that had been lost, since everything in our copies of Deuteronomy are in the first four books of the law. So there would be nothing in the book of Deuteronomy that they found in Josiah's time that could be considered a law that was lost or hidden from the people. In contrast, the Temple Scroll perfectly fits the character and quality of Josiah's reaction. That is, there are so many extra commandments in the Temple Scroll which are not in the first four books of the law. And the nature of these extra commandments, upon one realizing how much of the law in this scroll is missing from the first four books of the law, truly would make someone weep and truly would lead to a great revival and return to a law that was lost and hidden from the people. And since we know that history repeats itself and that Yahuwah works in cycles, the discovery of the lost temple scroll in modern times provides a perfect parallel to Hilkiah the priest in Josiah's time finding in the temple a scroll of a lost book of the law. So this temple scroll, if it is the lost book of the law, when you read it, it will truly make you weep more than you have ever wept before. Now, the following information I will be sharing is the evidence I have found that supports the Temple Scroll as being the original book of Deuteronomy. The Epistle of Barnabas is an ancient document written in the first century which quotes extra laws for the Day of Atonement as coming from the Law of Moses. The Epistle of Barnabas also quotes extra laws regarding clean and unclean animals as coming from the Law of Moses. However, our copies of the Law of Moses do not have these extra laws that the Epistle of Barnabas refers to. However, the Temple Scroll has extra laws for the Day of Atonement and extra laws regarding clean and unclean animals. So we see that Barnabas was using and appealing to a version of the Law of Moses which had extra laws about the Day of Atonement and about clean and unclean animals, and that the Temple Scroll is such a version of the Law of Moses, that is, a version which had extra laws about those, these very issues. The book of Tobit says that it is written in the Law of Moses that if a man disobeys the laws of liberate marriage, he must be executed to death. Nowhere is this found in our copies of the Law of Moses. Either the writer of Tobit is making things up, or his version of the Law of Moses had extra laws about marriage and leatherite marriage written in it. The Temple Scroll is a version of the Law of Moses which has extra mm -hmm. laws about marriage and leatherite marriage. So we see that there is a striking connection here between the version of the law that Tobit was reading and the Temple Scroll, as both containing extra marriage laws and laws for leatherite marriage. There are many commandments in the Temple Scroll which explicitly contradict the oral traditions and laws of the Pharisees. Either the writer of the Temple Scroll wrote it specifically as a polemic against the Pharisees, 
or the original version of the Torah was much more anti-Pharisee than it currently is. The problem with our copies of the Law of Moses is that it refers to certain commandments we are supposed to do, but which are not explained to us how we are to do them. So the fact is, our copies of the Law of Moses have many holes in them regarding how to properly keep fully the Law's requirements. The way that the Pharisees fill in those holes is through their oral law, the Talmud in their traditions they have passed down for over 2,000 years. The entirety of the argument of the Pharisees that they use to try and prove the legitimacy and authority for their oral law, being the oral law of Moses, accurately preserving the rest of the laws that Moses was given, but did not write down, rests on the fact that the law of Moses refers to other laws given to Moses which are not in our copies of the law of Moses. So their thinking was, well, if the law of Moses says there are other laws which were given to Moses, but these laws are nowhere to be found in the written law, that must mean that the extra laws passed down orally by the rabbis must have originated from the extra laws of Moses that were transmitted to him. The problem with this theory is that the Temple Scroll completely disproves it as false teaching. The Temple Scroll proves that the original law of Moses did not have any of the holes that our current copies have, but that the Temple Scroll gave a complete and highly detailed presentation of all the laws that were given to Moses, every single one of them, without omitting a single law. Now then, the Temple Scroll helps us to best explain the origination of the false traditions of the oral law of the Pharisees. The original law did not need an oral law, but because the original explanations contained in the original book of Deuteronomy were removed by the scribes, after a few generations, the Jews, accepting only the version of the law with the original explanations removed, were at a loss as to what those original explanations were and had to speculate the proper explanations for the missing passages based on their traditions and customs they passed down. Now let me clarify. I believe everything in our current copies of the Book of Deuteronomy is scripture. But I believe our copies of the Book of Deuteronomy are very dangerous because it gives the impression that the five books of the law are the complete presentation of the law. When interpreting the law with a false assumption that the law is complete, as it stands in our copies, it will almost inevitably lead to false doctrines. One great example is whether or not it is unlawful for a man to marry his own niece. The Pharisees in their oral laws argued that because Leviticus only says that it is unlawful for a man to marry his own aunt, that it is lawful and righteous and good for a man to marry his own niece. This argument of theirs assumes that their version of the Law of Moses is complete as it stands. However, if the Temple Scroll is the original Deuteronomy, then they would have known that it is also unlawful for a man to marry his own niece, since the Temple Scroll explicitly condemns marrying your own niece. So we see that if extra specifications of laws to be obeyed are removed from our copies of the law, and we try to appeal to our copies of the law as if they are complete, we will be led astray on that false notion. The Book of Jubilees, which claims to be a revelation to Moses, orders Moses to write down all the commandments given in Jubilees in the Book of the Law. Many of these things Moses was commanded to write down were not written in our copies of the Law of Moses, but are explicitly written in the Temple Scroll. This suggests that the writer of the Book of Jubilees considered the Temple Scroll to be the actual Book of the Law. The Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls had many extra commandments in their documents as well, and a large number of their interpretation of the Law of Moses agree with the extra commandments found in the Temple Scroll, showing that the Essenes considered the Temple Scroll to be the actual Book of the Law as well. In the Book of Ezekiel, there are many commandments for the Temple, courtyards, and priesthood which are not found in the Law of Moses. There also appear to be many differences. So different are some of these things that some Christians argue that Ezekiel is not proof of the law of Moses still being for today because they claim that Ezekiel disagrees with Moses. Now, either they are right and Ezekiel disagrees with Moses or the original law of Moses had additional commandments which agreed with Ezekiel. Based on a very cursory examination of Ezekiel in comparison with the Temple Scroll, it is evident that Ezekiel's commandments are derived from the Temple Scroll. Yahuwah must have inspired Ezekiel to quote or summarize large portions of the original book of Deuteronomy for our sakes in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48, knowing that this information would be crucial and not wanting it to be entirely lost to us. This is a testimony to the ingenious, geniusness of Yahuwah. 
Examples of where Ezekiel disagrees with our copies of Torah is the sacrifices the prince is committed and required to offer for the holy days. The numbers are inconsistent with our copies of the Law of Moses. Ezekiel himself actually claims that these laws for the temple are commandments and laws we are planning to do. Ezekiel 43 reads, And thou shalt describe the house, its exits and its entrances, and the plan thereof, and all its ordinances, and thou shalt make known to them all the regulations of it, and all the laws thereof, and order before them. And they shall keep all my commandments and all my ordinances, and do them. And thou shalt show the law of the house on top of the mountain. All its limits round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. Now, either Ezekiel is adding new commandments for the temple, or he is revealing lost portions of the Torah. Some messianics claim that Yahuwah cannot add new commandments. While the idea that Yahuwah cannot add new commandments is highly suspect, it would not make much sense at all for Yahuwah to add the temple commandments through Ezekiel, for Ezekiel's ministry was not one like Moses. And Ezekiel himself says his point was not to introduce new commandments, but to get them to repent and remember the old commandments. And furthermore, if people are right who teach that new commandments cannot be added to the law, then this proves the temple scroll must be the original Deuteronomy, since the only way for Ezekiel to not be a false prophet would be if what he is teaching in prophecy is not new commandments. But since Ezekiel's commandments are not in our copies of the law, and are sometimes inconsistent with our copies of the law, they would have to be considered new commandments unless the temple scroll which contained all these commandments by Ezekiel was the true and original book of the law. An example of an inconsistency between Ezekiel and Numbers is Ezekiel says seven bullocks and seven rams are to be offered daily the seven days of unleavened bread. Whereas Numbers, Book of Numbers, says only two young bullocks and one ram are to be offered daily the seven days of unleavened bread. Now, either Ezekiel contradicts the law of Moses, or the original law of Moses had additional commandments which agreed with Ezekiel. Based on the Temple Scroll's connection with Ezekiel, the, the original De Deuteronomy, that being the Temple Scroll, had many additional commandments, including the specifications that Ezekiel states. How to reconcile the inconsistencies is that Ezekiel's requirements are specifically the sacrifices of a high priest, not the sacrifices of the regular priests, whereas our copies of Torah and the Book of Numbers only specify the sacrifices for the priests, not the high priest sacrifices. The original Deuteronomy had both the sacrifices of Numbers and Ezekiel. That is, it had both the sacrifices for the priests and also the sacrifices for the high priests. Another example is that both Ezekiel and Amos teach that there is a special Hodesh Sabbath several times in the year, which is a holy Sabbath day where no work is allowed. One problem, this is not taught in our copies of the Torah. Yes, our copies say that the special Hodesh days are to have sacrifices on them, but nowhere do they say that they are no work days. Yet the Temple Scroll explicitly says that on Hodesh days, no work is allowed on them. Now, either Amos and Ezekiel are claiming days are required to be kept as Sabbath, which they had no authority to do so, or the original Torah taught they are required. Here are the passages in question. Amos chapter 8 reads, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the Hodesh be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small, and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat? And Ezekiel chapter 46 reads, Thus saith the Lord God, the gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut the six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and in the day of the Hodesh it shall be opened. And the prince shall enter by the way of the porch of the gate without, and shall stand by the post of the gate, and the priest shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offerings, and he shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Then he shall go forth, but the gate shall not be shut until the evening. Likewise, the people of the land shall worship at the door of this gate before the Lord in the Sabbaths and in the Hodeshim. This agrees with Isaiah, which claims that the Hodeshim are holy days of worship, assembly, and convocation. Isaiah 66 reads, And it shall come to pass, that from one Hodesh to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Nowhere is any of this committed in our copies of Torah, yet it is committed in the Temple Scroll. 
The Lives of the Prophets, a very ancient document from no later than 1st century AD, says the following, Ezekiel, while he was there, he showed to the people of Israel what was being done in Jerusalem and in the temple. He himself was born away thence and came to Jerusalem for a rebuke to the faithless. Also, after the manner of Moses, he foresaw the fashion of the temple with its walls and its broad surroundings, as Daniel also declared that it should be built. The writer here claims that Ezekiel foresaw the fashion of the temple with its walls and broad surroundings in the manner Moses foresaw it. This is evidence that the writer of the lives of the prophets considered the temple scroll and the Dead Sea Scrolls as the law of Moses inauthentic. Since the temple scroll is the only document where Moses sees the temple in the same manner that Ezekiel saw it. The law of Moses that we have only says do not work, but does not tell us much of anything as to what the definition of work is. In Isaiah, we are told that it is a sin to seek our own pleasure on the Sabbath. In Ezra and Nehemiah, we are told it's a sin to mourn and fast on the Sabbath. In Nehemiah and Amos, we are told it's a sin to buy and sell on the Sabbath. In Jeremiah, we are told it's a sin to carry burdens on the Sabbath. The problem, however, is that nowhere do our copies of Torah specify that these things are forbidden. Here, the book of Jubilees explicitly agrees and commands Moses to write in the Torah these commands for the Sabbath. Thus, the original Torah necessarily must have had more explicit commands about the Sabbath on it. The only can candidate for the possibility of such extra commandments for the Sabbath being commanded would be the Temple School. The book of Nehemiah is one of the most impressive pieces of evidence in the entire Bible in support of the Temple Scroll being the original book of Deuteronomy. Nehemiah chapter 1 reads, We have acted very corruptly against you, and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray you, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me, and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you are cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Nehemiah claims that these words come from the Law of Moses, but this quotation is not found anywhere in our copies of the Law of Moses. But similar words do occur in our copies. The closest passage in the Law of Moses to what Nehemiah quotes as being written in the Law of Moses comes from Deuteronomy chapter 30. And it reads as follows. And you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you and from there he will bring you. And then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Notice that this quotation in Nehemiah does not agree with our copies of the Torah. In particular, Nehemiah quotes Yahuwah speaking in the first person throughout, whereas our copies of Deuteronomy have Moses speaking about Yahuwah, but referring to him in the third person. And what do we have in the temple school? In the temple school is Deuteronomy chapters 12 to 22. But instead of putting the commandments of those chapters in the third person as it is in our copies, the temple scroll puts most of those commandments in the first person. This is a strong connection between the temple scroll and the book of Nehemiah. Clearly, Nehemiah had a version of Torah that he was using in which Yahuwah spoke characteristically in the first person. And the only book of the law where we see Yahuwah speaking just like that in the first person is the temple scroll. We also have evidence that the scribes were bold enough to change from third person to first person or vice versa because the Samaritan version of Torah and the Septuagint version of Torah sometimes record readings in the book of Deuteronomy which have Yahuwah speaking in first person. But most copies of the book of Deuteronomy in those same passages have Moses referring to Yahuwah in the third person instead. And sometimes in other passages of the book of Deuteronomy, the very reverse we have. Most people's copies of Torah have Yahuwah speaking in first person but the Samaritan and the Septuagint version of Deuteronomy have in those same passages Moses refer to Yahuwah in the third person instead. Here is another passage which is not written in our copies of the Law of Moses, but yet is quoted as from the Law of Moses in the apocryphal book called First Baruch. 
which was written uh, by Jeremiah's scribe, Baruch. It reads in chapter 2, As thou spakest by thy servant Moses in the day when thou didst command him to write the law before the children of Israel, saying, If ye will not hear my voice, surely this very great multitude shall be turned into a small number among the nations, where I will scatter them. For I knew that they would not hear me, because it is a stiff-necked people. And, but in the land of their captivities they shall remember themselves, and shall know that I am the Lord their God. For I will give them a heart and ears to hear, and they shall praise me in the land of their captivity, and think upon my name, and return from their stiff neck, and from their wicked deeds. For they shall remember the way of their fathers which sinned before the Lord, and I will bring them again into the land which I promised with an oath unto their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they shall be lords of it, and I will increase them, and they shall not be diminished. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them to be their God, and they shall be my people. And I will no more drive my people of Israel out of the land that I have given them. Notice this passage also is a quotation from the law, which is not in our copy of the law, which has Yahuwah speaking in the first person consistently throughout, just as the Temple Scroll and Nehemiah have Yahuwah speaking in the first person in the law. There are also... So many passages in the book of Nehemiah claim to be restoring the law of Moses and yet restores commandments which are not commanded in our copies of Torah but which are commanded in the temple scroll. Some examples are as follows. In Nehemiah chapter 4, there is an explicit imitation of what is commanded in the temple scroll. The peculiar strategy of designating by command half of the men to be in the army and the other half of the men to remain in the cities in order to protect and defend the cities appears as a command in both the temple scroll and the book of Nehemiah. While it is always possible that they both came to this conclusion by coincidence, it makes much more sense to suppose that this coincidence is due to Nehemiah deriving his strategy from the command of the Temple Scroll on this very issue. Nehemiah chapter 10 reads, Also, we made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, for the regular grain offering, for the regular burnt offering of the Sabbaths, the Hodeshim, and the set feasts, for the holy things, for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel, and all the work of the house of our God. We cast lots among the priests, the Levites, and the people, for bringing the wood offering into the house of our God, according to our fathers' houses, at the appointed times, year by year, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law. Here we see something extremely amazing. We are told that it is written in the law of Moses that the priests, Levites, and all the people of Israel are to bring the wood offering into the house, the temple of God, according to their father's houses at appointed festival times annually, year by year that is. One problem, it is not written anywhere in our law. The temple scroll, however, does contain it. So while our copies of Torah do command us to bring wood offering to the altar, they do not say we are to do it as an annual, year by year, appointed times, and do not say that it is to be brought according to our Father's houses. Yet in the Temple Scroll, we have explicitly the Law of Moses telling us we are to bring the wood offering at a specified time, yearly, according to the Father's houses. Thus, Nehemiah claims it is written in the Torah, and it is only written in the Temple Scroll and not in our copies of the Law. There are also many other passages from the book of Nehemiah which do not have parallels in our copies of the Law of Moses, but which have explicit parallels in the Temple Scroll. Josephus says the following in his fourth book of the Antiquities of the Jews. Accordingly, I shall now first describe this form of government which was agreeable to the dignity and virtue of Moses, and shall thereby inform those that read these antiquities what our original settlements were and shall then proceed to the remaining histories. Now those settlements are all still in writing as he left them, and we shall add nothing by way of ornament, nor anything besides what Moses left us. Only we shall so far innovate as to digest the several kinds of laws into a regular system. For they were by him left in writing as they were accidentally scattered in their delivery, and as he upon inquiry had learned them of God. On which account, I have thought it necessary to premise this observation beforehand, lest any of my own countrymen should blame me as having been guilty of an offense herein. He claims here that it is allowed to rearrange the text of Deut Deuteronomy for the sake of simplifying the scriptures for an ignorant audience. Notice that Josephus claims that he is not adding anything to the text of Deuteronomy. 
Yeah, he actually quotes something from the Temple Scroll, which is not in our copies of Deuteronomy. Here's what he claims Deuteronomy teaches. Aristocracy and the way of living under it is the best constitution, and may you never have any inclination to any other form of government, and may you always love that form and have the laws for your governors and govern all your actions according to them. For you need no God, uh, you need no governor but God. Uh, but if you shall desire a king, let him be one of your own nation. Let him be always careful of justice and other virtues perpetually. Let him submit to the laws and esteem God's commands to be his highest wisdom. But let him do nothing without the high priests and the votes of the senators. Let him not have a great number of wives, nor pursue after abundance of riches, nor a multitude of courses whereby he may grow too proud to submit to the laws. And if he affect any such thing, let him be restrained, lest he become so potent that his state be inconsistent with your welfare. The words he said, let him do nothing without the high priest and the votes of the senators, are not in our copies of Deuteronomy. Yet they are in the Temple Scroll copy. It reads, And twelve princes of his people shall be with him, and twelve priests and twelve Levites, who shall sit together with him for judgment and for the law. And he shall not rise his heart above them, nor shall he do anything in all his counsels outside of them. And then a little bit later it says, regarding war, and they are not to go forth until he has entered before the high priest, and he has consulted for him the decision of the Urim and Thummim. On his orders he shall go out, uh, and on his orders he shall enter, he and all the sons of Israel who are with him. He shall not go out on the advice of his heart until he has consulted the decision of the Urim and Thummim. So then Josephus further supports the idea that the temple scroll is the original Deuteronomy. Josephus elsewhere in his writings quotes David as saying that the laws that David gave to Solomon for how to build a temple were given to him by Moses. We don't see this in our copies of the Law of Moses, but we do see this in the Temple Scroll, which commands in full the construction of the temple in accordance with the specifications of the first temple that Solomon built. First Chronicles 28 reads, Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch, and of the houses thereof, and of the treasuries thereof, and of the upper chamber, chambers thereof, and of the inner parlors thereof, and of the place of the mercy seat, and the pattern of all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord, and of all the chambers round about, of the treasuries of the house of God, and of, and of the treasuries of the dedicated things, also for the courses of the priests and the Levites, and for all the work of the service in the house of the Lord, and for all the vessels of service in the house of the Lord. He gave up gold by weight for things of gold for all instruments of all manner of service, silver also for all instruments of silver by weight, for all instruments of every kind of service, even the weight for the candlesticks of gold and for their lamps of gold, by weight for every candlestick and for the lamps thereof, and for the candlesticks of silver by weight, both for the candlestick and also for the lamps thereof, according to the use of every candlestick. And by weight he gave gold for the tables of showbread, for every table, and likewise silver for the tables of silver. Also pure gold for the flesh hooks, and the bowls, and the cups, and for the golden basins he gave gold by weight for every basin, and likewise silver by weight for every basin of silver. And for the altar of incense refined gold by weight, and gold for the pattern of the chariot of the cherubim that spread out their wings and covered the ark of the covenant of the Lord. All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing, by his hand upon me, even all the works of this pattern. Second Chronicles has David saying that he received the pattern of, of all these things from Yahuwah, and that Yahuwah made David to understand it by giving David a writing. Either this writing was a new book which was given to David, or it was the temple scroll, which had all the laws in the temple. Such a writing was not preserved anywhere in any documents of the Christians or the Pharisees. Yet scripture here clearly says such a writing which commanded all the laws of the temple, once existed and was circulated. This description David gives of the contents of the writing that he received from Yahuwah about the temple is an exact and perfect description of the contents of the temple scroll. I am thus very confident that the temple scroll is in fact this writing containing all the laws of the temple that David is referring to. In 1 Samuel, we are told in chapter 8, then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us 
like all the nations. But the thing that displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And in verse 9 it reads, Now therefore hearken unto their voice, how be it yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked him of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvests, and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king which ye shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. And then in First Samuel 10 it, it says, and Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God gave, God saved the king. And then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. These passages read identical with Deuteronomy chapter 17, which says, When thou art come into the land, unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, the one from among thy brethren shalt thou set a, a king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests of the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. What law is this referring to? It clearly is not the law of Moses, but it's the law of the king. For it says this law, and this implies that it's referring to the subject just mentioned, or just about to be mentioned. The only law that is mentioned is the law about what the king should not multiply. That is the entire extent of this law of the king in our copies of Deuteronomy. Yet Samuel's copy of Deuteronomy must have had a much fuller law of the king because he said in, I'll quote the one part again of 1 Samuel 8, and he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots, and he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. This is clearly being connected to De Deuteronomy, because just prior in 1 Samuel 8, we are told, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and he said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. This is a pretty much a verbatim quotation of what Deuteronomy says that they would say. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me like all as all the nations that are about me. So Samuel's manner of the kingdom in his copy of Deuteronomy had more requirements. The temple scroll has has a much larger section of the manner of the kingdom which the priest was supposed to write out for the king. And amongst this manner of the kingdom law, the king was to follow, 
are found the very things that Samuel says are to be the manner of the kingdom. So, for example, the temple scroll says this. And this is the law for the king, which shall be written for him by the priests. On the day when they declare him king, they shall gather the sons of Israel from 20 years old to 60 years old, according to their banners. And they shall appoint at their head chiefs of thousands, chiefs of hundreds, chiefs of fifties, and chiefs of tens in all their cities. And he shall choose for himself a thousand of them, a thousand from each tribe, to be with him, twelve thousand men of war, who shall not leave him alone, and he be seized by the hands of the Gentiles. And all the chosen whom he has chosen shall be truthful men, fearers of God, enemies of bribery, men skilled in war, and they shall be with him continuously, day and night. And they shall keep him from every sinful deed and from the foreign nation, so that he does not fall into their hands. These words perfectly and exactly agree with Samuel's claim of what the manner of the kingdom of Deuteronomy is to be. I will quote it once more, again, from 1 Samuel. This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself for his chariots, and they be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties. In the same law of the kings, we are told the following. And they are not to go forth until he has entered before the high priest and has and he has consulted for him the decision of the Urim and Thummim. On his orders he shall go out, and on his orders he shall enter. He and all the sons of Israel who are with him. He shall not go out on the advice of his own heart until he has consulted the decision of the Urim and Thummim. This agrees perfectly with several examples in the Old Testament of King David consulting the oracle of Urim and Thummim to ask God whether they are allowed to enter war or not. One such example of that is 2 Samuel 5, verse 19. 1 Samuel 30 reads, And there was nothing lacking to them, neither great, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither, or, neither spoiled nor anything that ha, ha, they had taken to them. David recovered all. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. And David came to the two hundred men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial, of those that went with David, and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children that they may lead them away and depart. And then said David, You shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord has given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. This agrees with the temple scroll, which in the law of the kings says the following. And if they overcome their enemies and defeat them and put them to the sword, they shall gather their spoils, and from it they shall give to the king its tithe, and to the priests one thousand, and to the Levites one hundredth of the whole. And they shall divide the rest between those who fought in battle and their brothers who had to remain in their cities. So notice this also agrees with what Samuel said was the manner of a kingdom where he says that the king will take tithes one-tenth one from the people. Here is another passage from the Old Testament which agrees strikingly with the idea that the Temple Scroll is the original book of Deuteronomy. Jeremiah 26. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking, all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the princes of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord, and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city as ye have heard with your ears. Then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes and to all the people, saying, 
The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that ye have heard. Therefore now amend your ways in your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent of him, repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. As for me, behold, I am in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good and meet unto you. But know ye for certain that if ye put me to death, ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city, and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth the Lord hath sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. Then said the princes and all the people unto the priests and to the prophets, This man is not worthy to die, for he hath spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. This is a perfect parallel with the following quotation from the original Deuteronomy found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you shall keep all the, of the commandments which your God commands you by the prophet's mouth, and you shall keep all these precepts, and shall return to Yahuwah your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and your God will repent of the fury of his great wrath in order to save you from your trials. However, the prophet who rises up to preach apostasy to you, to make you turn away from God, shall die. And if the tribe from which he comes should rise up and say, He is not to die, for he is a just man, he is a trustworthy prophet, you shall come with the tri that tribe and your elders and your judges to the place which your God will choose in one of your tribes before the appointed priest upon whose head the oil of anointing has been poured. The parallels are amazing. Notice that in both quotations, first a group of people condemn a prophet as a false prophet. Secondly, those from his land are to rise up to say that he is not to die, and they have to go to the temple, the place where Yahuwah would choose before the priest to say this. This passage in, Je in Jeremiah perfectly agrees with the procedure in what the Dead Sea Scrolls claims is the original Deuteronomy. Another very amazing example is the Temple Scroll says that blind people are not allowed in the temple area. This agrees perfectly with 2 Samuel 5, chapter 5, which says the same thing. As I suggested before, the scribes had a tendency to remove God from the text and distance us from him. Thus, a change from first to third person always occurred when condensing and summarizing the story. Since Nehemiah is much more ancient than the copies of the law, and so also first Baruch, and both quoted a first-person version of De Deuteronomy which no longer exists, it is proven that the original Deuteronomy was a first-person account from Yahuwah as opposed to the third-person account we have now. If you disagree, then you are disagreeing with Nehemiah, who quoted a version of Deuteronomy which agrees with the first-person nature of the Temple Scroll and disagrees with the third-person account that the Pharisaic and Samaritan Deuteronomy preserves for us. Now, if the book of Deuteronomy really were the word of God, then it would bear the marks of divine authorship. It would have intelligence. It would be organized perfectly and wisely. This is not what we see in any version of Deuteronomy except that of the Temple Scroll. All other copies of Deuteronomy outside of the Dead Sea Scrolls are very poorly edited as can be shown with the cursory examination. Um, when I finish the presentation, if there are any questions that are unanswered, I can address them at the end. There are two key features that show our copies of Deuteronomy are very inferior to the Temple School. Errors in poor arrangement. There are many errors in our copies in which our copies have accidentally left out words but in those very same passages, the Temple Scroll does not leave the words out. As for poor ordering and arrangement of the book of, of Book of Deuteronomy, evidence of poor arrangement occurs throughout the entirety of the Book of Deuteronomy, but one example should suffice to illustrate the point. Our copies of the Law of Moses are very unsatisfactorily arranged, and the arrangement is not in any way indicative of divine inspiration, whereas the Temple Scroll has a perfect and much superior arrangement fitting the mind of Yahuwah and bearing witness to its validity. So the clearest and most convincing example of this is the following. Our copies of Deuteronomy say in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 25 to 23, verse 8, the following. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death, for as when a man rises against his neighbor and 
slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, and then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her. He hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. A man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover his father's skirt. He that is wounded in the stones, or hath his privy member cut off, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt. And because they hired against thee Balaam the son of Baer of Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse thee. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee. Thou shalt not seek their peace, nor their prosperity, all thy days forever. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the congregation of the Lord in their third generation. The Temple Scroll, however, reads of the same passage it reads, But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, in a place far and hidden from the city, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in a damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man rises against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, the young girl screamed, but there was no one to help her. If a man seduces a young virgin who is not betrothed, and she is permitted to him by the law, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife. Because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. A man shall not take his father's wife, his father's wife nor discover his father's skirt. A man shall not take his brother's wife, nor discover his brother's skirt, the son of his father or the son of his mother, because it is sexual impurity. A man is not to take his sister, the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. It is an abomination. A man is not to take the sister of his father or the sister of his mother, because it is depravity. A man is not to take the daughter of his brother or the daughter of his sister, because it is an abomination. A man is not to take the daughter of his son or the daughter of his daughter, because it is an abomination. Notice in our copies of Deuteronomy, it goes from a very long talk of, topic about sex with betrothed and unbetrothed women, then goes on to a new topic about a man's skirt not being uncovered, but only covers that for one verse, and then immediately after, in the very next verse, abandons the new topic it just introduced, and moves on to a topic about who can or cannot enter the congregation. Completely random and uninspired. Yet in the Temple Scroll, it goes on, continuing the topic it just introduced does not abandon it, and goes on to discuss in detail the sexual sins we are not allowed to do. In particular, this passage condemned having sex with a niece. The Pharisees are notorious for teaching that it is not a sin, nor contrary to Torah, to have sex with your niece, but they teach that it is only a sin to have sex with your aunt. It seems that originally this passage was removed by a scribe who thought it was a sin to have sex with your niece, but was just trying to remove the content about the sexual laws because he felt it was necessary to give the full list again. He felt it was unnecessary to give a full list again. And then afterwards, several generations passed, and people read too much into the sexual laws of Leviticus, and concluded that since there is no mention of one's niece in Leviticus, that it is not a sin to have sex with your niece. At any rate, this is evidence of Pharisee tampering with the original Torah. Either the scribe disagreed with the law about sex with one's niece, or agreed with it, but it is evident that the original law had this commandment in it, and thus the whole Pharisaic doctrine is demolished, which says otherwise. I will now present two striking examples of passages where our copies of Deuteronomy are very inferior to the Temple Scroll version of the same passages. Deuteronomy 17 reads, And thou shalt come unto the priests and the Levites, and unto the judges that shall be in those days, and inquire, and they shall show thee the ascendance of judgment. And thou shalt do according to the sentence, which they of that place which the Lord shall choose shall show thee. And thou shalt observe to do according to all that they inform thee, according to the sentence of the law which they shall teach thee, 
and according to the judgment which they shall tell thee, that thou shalt do. Thou shalt not decline from the sentence which they shall show thee to the right hand nor to the left. The same passage in the temple scroll reads, And thou shalt come unto the priests and Levites, and unto the judge that shall be in those days, and they shall inquire the matter about which you come to investigate, and they shall show thee the judgments. And thou shalt do according to the sentence which they inform thee, and according to the sentence of the law which they shall teach thee from the book of the law. They shall tell it to thee accurately from the place I shall choose to make my name dwelling upon it. Thou shalt be careful to observe to do according to all that they inform thee. And according to the judgment which they shall tell thee, thou shalt do. Thou shalt not decline from the sentence which they shall show thee to the right hand or to the left. Notice in the temple scroll version of the same passage, it says the judges shall teach the law from the book of the law. The requirement that the judges' teachings must be from the book of the law is a serious limitation on the realm of their authority. The judges and elders wanted the authority to add new commandments of oral Torah through rabbinic dogmas. However, the temple scroll says we are only required to do according to the teachings of the rabbis that is in accordance with the book of the law. So it makes sense why the Pharisees would prefer the version of Deuteronomy that does not have this limitation. Another example, amazing example, is the commandments to hang people on a tree. Deuteronomy chapter 21 says, And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he died. So shalt thou put away put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. If a man hath committed a sin worthy of death, and he is to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. The temple scroll, that same passage, reads, and all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he died. So shalt thou put away, put evil away from among you. And all the children of Israel shall hear and fear. If a man passes on information against his people, or betrays his people to a foreign nation, or does evil against his people, you shall hang him on a tree, and he will die. On the evidence of two witnesses, or on the evidence of three witnesses, he shall be put to death, and they shall hang him on the tree. If it happens that a man has committed a capital offense, and he escapes among the nations, and curses his people and the children of Israel, he also you shall hang on a tree, and he will die. And their bodies shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed by God and man, that thy land be not defiled, which I give thee for inheritance. Comparing the two, one can see here clear marks of abbreviation in our copies. What our copies say is the vague and ambiguous words, committed a sin worthy of death. The temple scroll, however, does not give permission for hanging for any and every crime worthy of death, but clarifies, saying that it's only for sins of betraying the nation, doing evil against the nation, or for those who escape a capital crime and mock uh, the nation of Israel that he escaped alive. Notice how inferior our version of Deuteronomy is in this passage. It does not tell us when to use hanging as its capital punishment, but only t tells that Hanging is to be used for some capital crimes. The Temple Scroll, on the other hand, clearly explains when this punishment is to be used. There are so many other examples of passages and readings in our copies of Deuteronomy which are very inferior to the corresponding places of those passages that are in the Temple Scroll. One final passage to leave you all with is the Law of the King. I'm going to read for you all the entirety of the Law of the King, which is very powerful. And so it, it's, uh, now as I mentioned earlier, Deuteronomy chapter 17 explicitly says that there is a law for the king that is supposed to be written out. Yet our copies do not present a satisfactory law for the king that is sufficient in any capacity for a government constitution. Yet the original version from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Temple Scroll, paints a very different picture. The following is the law of the kings down on the Temple Scroll, which is a very good government constitution. When thou art come into the land which I giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom I shall choose, one from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt on account of war to the end that he should multiply horses and the silver and gold. 
for as much as I have said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, lest they turn his heart away from me. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, they shall write for him this law, according to the book which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear me, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. And this is the law for the king which shall be written for him by the priests. On the day when they declare him king, they shall gather the sons of Israel from twenty years old to sixty years old, according to their banners. And they shall appoint at their head chiefs of thousands, chiefs of hundreds, chiefs of fifties, and chiefs of tens in all their cities. And he shall choose for himself a thousand of them, a thousand from each tribe to be with him, twelve thousand men of war who shall not leave him alone, and he be seized by the hands of the Gentiles. And all the chosen whom he has chosen shall be truthful men, fearers of God, enemies of bribery, men skilled in war. And they shall be with him continuously day and night, and they shall keep him from every sinful deed and from the foreign nations so that he does not fall into their hands. And twelve princes of his people shall be with him, and twelve priests, and twelve Levites, who shall sit together with him for judgment and for the law. And he shall not rise his heart above them, nor shall he do anything in all his counsels outside of them. And he shall not take a wife from among all the daughters of the Gentiles, but instead he shall take for himself a wife from the house of his father, from his fam father's family. And he shall take no other wife in addition to her, for she alone will be with him all the days of her life. And if she dies, he shall take for himself another from the house of his father, from his family. And he shall not pervert justice, and he shall not accept a bribe to pervert righteous judgment. And he shall not crave a field, a vineyard, any wealth, a house, or any valuable thing in Israel, and seize it. And then a little bit later, because the rest, this part is broken, and it's missing in the scroll. And then it continues, And if the king hears that some nations or people is attempting to steal from anything which belongs to Israel, he shall send for the chiefs of thousands and the chiefs of hundreds, those stationed in the cities of Israel, and they shall send with him the tenth part of the people to go out with him to war against their enemies. And they shall go out with him. And if a large host entered the land of Israel, they shall send with him a fifth part of the men of war. And if it is a king with chariots and horses with many men, then they shall send with him a third part of the men of war. And the other two divisions shall guard their cities and their border, so that no horde will enter their land. And if the war worsens for him, they shall send him half of the people, the men of the army, but they shall not remove the half of the people from their cities. And if they overcome their enemies and defeat them and put them to the sword, they shall gather their spoils, and from it they shall give to the king its tithe, and to the priests one thousandth, and to the Levites one hundredth of the whole. And they shall divide the rest between those who fought in battle and their brothers who had to remain in their cities. And if he goes out to war against his enemies, a fifth part of the people shall go out with him, the men of war, almighty men of valor. And they shall keep themselves from every unclean thing, and from every shameful thing, and from every iniquity and guilt. And they are not to go forth until he has entered before the high priest, and he has consulted for him the decision of the Urim and Thummim. On his orders he shall go out, and on his orders he shall enter, he and all the sons of Israel who are with him. He shall not go out on the advice of his heart until he has consulted the decision of the Urim and Thummim. And he will have success in all his paths, as he has gone out according to the decision which I have revealed to him through the Urim and Thummim of the high priest. But if he and his people shall not hearken to these commands, then he will have failure in all his paths, and as he has gone out without my guidance, and I will bring a sword upon him that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant, and when they are gathered together within their cities, I will send a pestilence among them, and they shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. They shall disband them over many lands, and they shall be there a byword and a guide, and under a heavy yoke, and under a lack of everything. And there they shall worship gods made by the hands of men, wood and stone, silver and gold. And during all this, their cities shall become a waste, and a mockery, and a ruin, and their enemies shall be appalled at them. And they themselves, in the lands of their enemies, shall sigh and scream under a heavy yoke, and they shall call, but I shall not listen. They shall shout, but I shall not reply to them, because of the evil of their deeds. And I will hide my face from them, and they shall be 
fodder and cray and spoil, and no one will save them because of their wickedness, for they broke my covenant and their soul loathed my law, so that they become guilty of all wrongdoing. Afterwards they shall come back to me with all their heart and with all their soul in agreement with all the words of this law, and I will save them from the hand of their enemies and redeem them from the hand of those who hate them and bring them into the land of their fathers. And I shall redeem them and multiply them and rejoice in them. And I shall be their God and they shall be my people. And the king who prostitutes his heart and his eyes from my commandments shall have no one who will sit on the throne of his fathers, never, because I shall prevent forever his descendants from governing again in Israel. But if he walks according to my precepts and keeps my commandments and does what is right and good before me, he shall not lack one of his sons to sit on the throne of the kingdom of Israel forever. And I shall be with him and free him from the hand of those who hate him and from the hand of those who seek to destroy his life. And I shall give to him all his enemies and he shall rule them at his will. They shall not rule him. And I shall place him above and not below, at the head and not at the tail. And he will extend his kingdom for many days, he and his sons after him. So that's the entirety of the book of the law uh, that was in a temple scroll. It should be quite apparent why a scribe would be motivated to remove this law. Like the judges, they wanted their kings to have an absolute monarchy as their authority and not be limited by the priestly authority. That is why they told Samuel they did not want to submit to his authority anymore, but instead wanted to submit to the authority of the king. Samuel the prophet in 1 Samuel said that the people would cry out to God because of these laws and that they would not like having a king and regret it. Thus, it makes sense that the Jews would not have liked these laws just as Samuel predicted and that they strove to remove these laws of the king if at all possible. Now, to conclude, I'm going to give a very brief general overview of all the extra things that the Temple Scroll commands which are not in our copies of the Book of Deuteronomy. I'm just going to give a list of each of the things, uh, the general things that the Temple Scroll commands, which are not in our copies of Deuteronomy. The Temple Scroll commands the following extra commandments. How to build a temple building and how to build a temple items. It commands how the proper way to offer the showbread is to offer it with the incense upon it. it commands that the Kodeshim are to be kept as holy days in which no work is allowed that sons of Aaron are not automatically to be considered priests, but that any son of Aaron who wants to serve as a priest must be consecrated in the ceremony of the consecration of priests. It commands additional rules about how to keep Passover properly. It commands more clearly when to begin the counting of 50 days to Shavuot. It commands us to keep a second Shavuot period immediately after the first Shavuot period every year in which the 50th day is to be kept at the Festival of New Wine. It commands important laws for the grain offering. It commands the festival of new wine to be kept every year as a holy day. It commands us to keep a third Shavuot period immediately after the second Shavuot period, every year in which the 50th day is to be kept as the festival of new oil. The festival of new oil is to, uh, it commands to be kept every year as a holy day. It commands us to keep the six days of the wood offering immediately after the feast of new oil. And it commands on which day that and the order that each tribe is to come to offer the wood during the six days of the wood offering. It commands a staircase tower with a bridge to the room of the temple above the Holy of Holies is to be built. It commands that the disposed blood of the sacrifices must not be touched by anyone after it has been disposed of and tells us how to dispose of it. it commands the measurements for the building for the labor that is required to be built for the temple. It commands the steward's building of the temple items to be made in a specific place and with specific dimensions and qualifications. It commands that any priest who enters to serve as priest without wearing the sacred garments must be executed to death. It commands that a building immediately west of the temple is to be built for the storage of the sacrifices. And it also tells us that the sacrifices of the priests must not be stored in the same part of the building as the sacrifices of the people, but must be stored separately. It commands the specifications for the dimensions of the first courtyard and its gates that are required to be built. It commands where to build the four cooking rooms of the temple. It commands the construction of chambers where the priests are required to eat the sacrifices. It commands the specifications for the dimensions of the second courtyard and its gates that are required to be built. It commands that no males younger than 20 years of age, no males who haven't paid the half shekel of their atonement, no Gentiles, no women, 
and no Israelites less than the fourth generation of proselytes are allowed to enter into the second courtyard of the temple. It commands what the value of the shekel is required to be. It commands that anyone is that anyone who is not allowed to enter the second courtyard is allowed to enter the third courtyard if they are clean. It commands the specifications for the dimensions of the third courtyard and its gates that are required to be built. It commands the dimensions and function of the chambers of the third courtyard for all of Israel. It commands that the second tithe for the three Shavuot festivals of first fruits, new wheat, new wine, and new oil, must be eaten before the new year's first fruits. It tells us that if it's not eaten before the next year's first fruits, it must be burnt and is forbidden to be eaten. It commands what and when and how to offer the tithes, depending on how far away you live from the temple. It commands that the second tithe can only be eaten on holy days and not on work days. It commands the kosher fruit laws mentioned in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 23 to 25. It commands the proper dimensions and designated areas of all the storerooms for Israel and the tithe storage that are required to be built. Commands the priestly courses to be observed and tells us how the change of courses is to be properly done. Commands that anyone who came in contact with semen is not allowed to enter the temple's courtyards for three days. Commands that blind people are not allowed to enter into the courtyard of the temple. Commands any man with a seminal disease resulting in an abnormal discharge is to not enter the temple courtyards until he has been purified from his discharge seven full days. Commands anyone who has had contact with a human corpse to not enter the temple courtyards until they are purified according to the seven-day specification. Commands that a leper or diseased person is not allowed to enter the temple courtyards until he is healed and atoned for. Commands that a merchant and trader is not allowed to buy or sell anything in the temple. Commands that dogs and chickens and all unclean birds are not allowed to enter the temple courtyards. Commands the proper dimensions of the barrier between the third courtyard and the city surrounding the courtyard that are required to be built. Commands where and how far away the buildings for excreting human waste are to be built from the temple's courtyards. And it also tells for very unclean individuals, we are required to make outside of all our cities special places for them to live in isolation from our cities until they are healed. And we're getting close to the end of this list. Um, what, it also commands why the unclean are to be isolated from the temple courtyards far away. And commands that only the hides and skins of animals slaughtered in the temple courtyards are allowed to enter the temple courtyards. It commands which insects you are and are not allowed to eat. It commands that no one is to eat any animal that dies of itself, even Gentiles. It commands that tattoos are forbidden for all people, even if they are not gotten for the dead. It commands that the dead must not be buried in your houses or living areas and tells us that one cemetery alone is allowed and required for every four cities in which the dead are required to be buried. Commands that in every city, those with a skin disease, a seminal disease, or a menstrual disease, or women who are in the impurity and uncleanness of their childbirth, must not live inside the cities, but that places must be made for them on the outskirts of the city for them to dwell in until they are healed. It commands very detailed requirements for dealing with cleaning the uncleanness of dead human bodies. It commands that anyone who is not purified from the uncleanness of contact with a dead person or a place housing a dead person in the manner described in the law remains perpetually unclean until he purifies himself according to the specification of the law, commands that a pregnant woman with a dead child inside her womb is to be treated unclean as a grave as long as the child remains inside her body, commands that we are to treat unclean animals which creep as more unclean than all other unclean animals and tells us in detail how they are more unclean than the other unclean animals and how their uncleanness can spread. Commands that any judge or government leader of the people who is a corrupt judge must be executed with the death penalty. Commands that an animal and its child must not both be killed, one or the other is to be killed, not both. Commands the proper distance required away from the temple for animals not dedicated to the temple being allowed to be eaten or slaughtered for consumption. Commands the laws of vows for males and laws of vows for females. Commands that the sentence of the law that we are required to obey on the rabbis and judges of Israel are only the teachings they teach which are from the book of the law. And then it commands all those things from the book of the law, the kings that I read. And then commands extra specifications for the tithes of the Levites and the priests. Commands that a woman from the captive Gentiles is not allowed to partake of any holy things of Israel for seven years. 
and commands that hanging is to be used for traitors of the nation, evildoers against the nation, and Israelites slandering or, slandering or mocking the nation of Israel. And it commands a complete list of which sexual relationships are to be considered incest. Now, that's the, that's the end of the list that I have. There are also many other things the original book of Deuteronomy commanded, which are, which are not in the temple scroll, because as I said, there are parts of the temple scroll which are missing due to how poorly some parts of the scroll was preserved, and the beginning of the scroll and the ending of the scroll was not preserved. But so there were many other laws, such as laws for the Sabbath and other laws of crime and punishment that were in the this temple school. So with that said, that is the presentation, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, let me see, looking through the questions, to see if there are any questions that were not answered. Um so does the temple school have any bearing on the true calendar? Yes, it does. It uh, it has many extra laws for the calendar, which uh, are often contradict people's understanding of how the calendar works. And it even has some extra festivals, as I mentioned. Um, and then um, if the, let's see, if the temple school was allowed to be a bridge later on, and wouldn't that validate Kiko's claim in the Nazarene Acts that the whole temple system was uh, by the Most High deliberately set to fail? Um, I don't think um, for this seminar that, that is a good uh, place to answer that question, and uh, I have to think more about that question to give a good answer for that, um, because that's a a big question that I can, for anyone who's interested in that question that Chris asked, I can share my view on that on Facebook. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, so there any other questions for those who are here, or um, if not, then the that's the end of the presentation. Yeah, the, the, the Shavuot, uh, what's interesting about the three Shavuot, there's three different Shavuot periods. Only one of them uh, has a, a Sabbath day where no work is to be done, and that's the first Shavuot, the one we're all familiar with. So the, the Feast of Weeks, um, the first one, that, that one you know, on the 50th day, you don't do any work. But for the other two Shavuot periods, the 50th day you can do work on those days. Uh, but what supports, what there's evidence that actually supports the Temple Scrolls claim that there's three different Shavuot periods. You're going to find throughout the, the Old Testament many times, it talks about the first fruits, first fruits, and it'll mention, it always mentions just three first fruits periods. It mentions first fruits of new wheat, first fruits of new wine, and first fruits of new oil, always in that order. So why is why are all the books of the Old Testament only isolating those three plants as the first fruits? It, it always mentions those three in that order, first fruits of new wheat, first fruits of new wine, and the first fruits of new oil. So that suggests that there was some type of only a point in time for these three, these three crops: the wheat, the wine, and the oil. Um, and that's what I have to say about the the. Oh, and it also gives like extra. It gives lists of sacrifices that are to be done for for those for the three Shavuot periods. It gives the extra sacrifices for those two extra several periods. Um, so any other questions or is that it? All right, looks like uh, looks like that's it. So thank you all for listening to this presentation. Um, if you if any of you I, I see a lot here are have joined now. So you guys joined in um, while the presentation was going on. This is the, this has been recorded. So if you missed the beginning part, please if you're interested in this presentation, but you missed the beginning parts, go back to the uh, when 
when the recording is loaded up, go and listen to the whole thing in, in its entirety because I believe it's a very powerful presentation. But so thank you all again and shalom. Um, and I can answer any more questions on Facebook for those who have questions. Shalom. Thank you all. And be blessed. There's more to come.